You all ready to talk about this? You guys know what we're doing tonight? I always said I, I had to be quiet. I couldn't ask any questions. <laughs> So the way tonight works is I'm going to be hitting one point of view really hard and then I'm going to hit the other point of view really hard. My goal as I present each side is that I'm presenting it as though I represent that side. Uh, I might even dress up like Jacob Arminius based upon the most recent pictures we have of him and then I'll probably dress up like John Calvin and I will be each one of those individuals. That gives me the freedom to say whatever I want because I won't be Pastor Mike, I'll be one of those two people. Uh, so that frees me up to be a little bit more pointed with certain comments and certain points of view. Uh, what you'll find tonight, you'll have a certain level of tension, okay? If you're like everyone else in the world, like when someone starts presenting something that kind of rubs against you in a way that you're not sure if you like, you're gonna get defensive. You're gonna wanna kind of push back. Go ahead and do that. Like you have a paper, you can write down your thoughts and uh, at the end, uh, maybe it'll be after the fact, but I'll give us some time to, to talk about it unless you're in a rush to get somewhere. Um, but uh, I will, present something on both sides that you'll love and something that'll push you a little bit. My goal is to push you. Wherever you are tonight, my goal is to push you a little bit, okay? And if you do have a position, if you don't know the other position and you can't argue the other position, then you don't, you're, you don't know your position very well. It's like just basic debate, right? On a debate team, you need to be able to debate either side. So I need you to know it well enough to even know why you are what you are. If you don't, if you can't argue the other side, then you don't know it as well as you could maybe should. Okay? So we'll do that. Um, but first I want to kind of start with where they agree. Before we focus on where they disagree, I like to focus on where they agree. So go ahead and open up to page 30 of your book. <clears throat> and before we jump in, I'd like for us to, to pray together and ask for God's help because uh, we will need it. Father, I pray that you would indeed just lead our hearts, lead our minds, uh, allow us to see your word for what it says. It's so easy to go into your word sometimes with an agenda or a desire for it to say a certain thing. But Lord, I pray that you speak for yourself tonight. And in some ways we're going to get excited about what your word says, and sometimes we might want to push back against what your word says. But may we know it as clearly and as well as we can, and may this study bring you much glory. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So sometimes this topic is something that defines a church. From my point of view, I find that kind of ridiculous. Like, this is a fun thing to talk about, but this isn't something that people divide over. This isn't something where there should be division. You can have two different points of view on this. There are people who are much smarter than all of us combined on each side of this conversation, okay? So it's okay if there's some disagreement, uh, if there's discussion that takes place. But if it ever becomes the centerpiece of a church and the only thing that's discussed then we probably miss something. Like the gospel is the centerpiece. The beauty and reality of Christ is the centerpiece. If we get more excited about this discussion than the mercy of God, the grace of God, the justice of God, the, the reality and nature and characteristics of God, then again, we've, we've swung and we've missed. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not important because it is in scripture and everything in scripture matters. We just have to make sure we keep our priorities in line. Uh, but we're gonna spend an hour and we're gonna talk about it. Page 30. When we talk about the purpose of salvation, the purpose of salvation, it is always going to land on the glory of God. It's always going to land on, biblically, the glory of God. Why did God save us? It's the same reason why he created us. For his sake. For his glory. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah 42. If you've got a Bible with you. We're going to be in Isaiah for a couple verses. And you don't have to believe me. I think just these verses stick out pretty hard of what the Lord is all about. Isaiah 42, verse 8, he says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praises to graven images. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. It is his. He does not freely give it away. No one else gets to take it. It is God's glory. It is important to him. He will not give it to another. All right, flip your page to chapter 43. Here the context is, is the Lord is reminding Israel, the people of God, that he is their Lord. And then he says in verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, which is the people who he's talking to, the people of Israel, and whom I have created for a purpose, who I created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Why did he form and create the people of Israel? 
for his glory. So not for their benefit, though they will benefit. The primary reason is for his glory. That's the centerpiece of that decision. Verse 21 in the same chapter, he says, he talks about the people whom I've formed for myself. Those people will declare his praise. So the result of these people who are formed and created by God, their response to that reality is they glorify God with praise. They will glorify him. They will praise him. Let's go to the next page, verse 25. The Lord says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. So he talks to the people of Israel, and he offers forgiveness, and he wipes away transgressions and sin. Why does he do it? For his own sake. Sometimes we get so focused on God, God's doing things for our sake, that we're the center, that we're the most important thing. Scripture says over and over again, the centerpiece of why God makes his decisions is first, himself. Second, it's you. When God created you and me, we didn't become more important than God. He is still the most important thing. And his decisions are based on him. But so often, his decisions are to give us exceeding abundant love and grace. So we benefit from them, but he is still the most important being in the world. The centerpiece of everything is the glory of God. Uh, and that continues through the New Testament. Ephesians 1, 4 and 6, Ephesians 9, Ephesians 11 and 12 says over and over and over again, we were chosen for the praise of his glory. We were adopted for the praise of his glory. Okay? We were elected. We were, um, he uses the word predestined. We were given and made known the mystery of Christ. Why? To the praise of his glory. In the Old Testament, Salvation was based around God's glory. In the New Testament, salvation is based around the praise of God's glory. So, ongoingly, there's a consistency here where everything is based around and leads to the glory of God. So, even as I get on the board here and I start charting out like what one point of view views and what the other point of view views and believes, they're both leading towards one conclusion— Okay, so even though they are very different points of view on this concept of how we are saved, at the end, they both land here. So there'll be dissimilarity, 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 and it's going to end with similarity. Okay, it will get there. I'll show that to you. Um, but that's where it ends. And if it doesn't end there, then you've missed. It ends with the glory of God. He is the centerpiece of all of it. Go to the next page, please. Page 31. Before I become Jacob Arminius, which is about to happen, which is where we'll start, I want you to be able to think through different types of arguments. Because I want you to be able to identify what type of arguments coming after you. Not every argument is created equally. Not every argument is equally as powerful. The, like a level one argument or the strongest argument comes from clear biblical statements that are said over and over again with clarity and consistency. Like the state, statement, Jesus is Lord, we see that in multiple ways, over and over again, clearly, consistently, from cover to cover in Scripture. Jesus is Lord, okay? So that's a level one argument. Uh, a level two argument is more of a biblical inference. Like, it seems like the Bible's pointing in this direction. It seems like this is what's going to happen or how we would best describe this. It's not clearly stated, but it seems to be inferred from the text. There's a, there's a step that needs to be made outside of the clarity of Scripture to come to a conclusion. Uh, one example of that would be the Trinity. The Bible doesn't say Trinity, but we see through Scripture that there's clearly God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They are three and they are one, so the inference there is there's a Trinity. Okay. Another word that uh, we don't see said in Scripture is this concept of a rapture. But we see these things where it looks like something's going to happen where we are taken up to be with Christ, and we call it the rapture. But the Bible doesn't say, you will be raptured, okay? It's an inference. It's a second step to get to that conclusion. That's not quite as strong as just straight-up biblical arguments. Third level is a philosophical or logical argument. This is a position based not necessarily on Scripture, but is, in, but is grounded in what attempts to be a consistent or logical set of thoughts based upon several, though not all, known facts. 
Logical bridges are attempted where Scripture does not give clarity. Okay, so what, what I'm saying there is, the Bible says this, then the Bible says that, then the Bible stops talking about it. But it seems like the direction the Bible was going is C, D, E, and maybe to F. So at that point, the Bible has stopped talking about it. But we, logical beings, start philosophically and logically trying to, to walk through what the next logical steps would be in where God's going with something. Here's the tricky thing. This is why this is a third tier argument. You and I don't think the same way God thinks. Ephesians chapter, Isaiah chapter 55, verses like 10, 11, and 12 says, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are above your ways. So if you think you figured out my logical pattern, you haven't because his thoughts are not the same as your thoughts. He sees things from a whole nother level. He has all information, all knowledge at his fingertips. So he sees it from that level. You and I never ever will. Okay? It doesn't mean we can't think that way. It doesn't mean we can't like, try to figure that out. But don't do this. Don't say, because I've heard this many times, God's a God of logic, and logically, this is the next step. Okay, well, God didn't tell you that. Like, you figured out what you think is the logical next step. Don't say God's logical, I'm logical, therefore I think just like God, I win the argument. When, if you do that, you're the dummy in the room, okay? Because there's, sometimes there's a dummy in the room. If you think that you figured out God's logic, you might be the dummy in the room. I've been there, you've probably been there. Let's not go back there, okay? So that's like the third tier level of arguments. So the way I'm gonna work through this, so instead of going through like 20 pages in the book, I'm gonna squeeze it onto one page. So what I have here is what I'm gonna put on the board. So I would encourage you to maybe take a blank page, flip it over, and you might wanna write it out as I write it out. I'm gonna take this, and this is gonna go boom right up on there. So I'm just gonna go through like the six or seven top arguments from my point of view of each position. Let me just talk about each position for a second before we jump in. One position, the Arminian position, says that we choose God. Christ died on the cross, offers salvation, and we choose him. Like from ourselves, from our own power, own ability, we reach out and we say, I want you. And we go after God. The other side, which is called Calvinism, is you can't. You're so spiritually dead that you can't reach out. So you're completely dependent on God reaching down to you. And God gets 100% of the credit of reaching you. He picked you. You didn't pick him. So those are kind of the two points of view. Now, there's some implications of those two different points of view that we'll get to, but that primarily are the two different points of view. So let's go, we'll go blue pen. Hi, I'm Jacob Arminius, okay? For centuries, I've been trying to get people to understand that we pick God, God doesn't pick us. I'm going to work through with you six huge arguments that you need to understand to realize what it means, okay, when God says that he loves us and that we chose him. So let's work through those. Jacob Arminius. I thought about trying to do an accent, but I'm terrible at him, so I'm just going to talk. British and, like, Australian just get hooked together, so I'll be like... I need a cocktail stick on the Barbie. And I'm like, what? Which one was that? So <clears throat> the first one. In scripture, we see over and over again this concept of foreknowledge. Okay, so oftentimes when the Bible speaks of election, predestination, being chosen, we see this word connected. We see this word, this idea of foreknowledge there. If you go to page 32, two of the verses are written out for you. So on page 32 in blue, we see Romans 8, 29, and 30. Here's the word foreknowledge. It says this, For those God foreknew, he also pre predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. So, who was predestined? Those who God foreknew. So what's the content of that knowledge? What did God know about them? to be able to say and choose to say they're predestined. Are they predestined because God picked them? Or perhaps what we're learning right here and what we're seeing is God foreknew that they would choose him. So when God looks down the tunnel of time, he sees individuals, men and women, who in the future 
will choose him, because God sees time all at the same time. So he sees, he foreknows who will choose him. So he knows who his predestined, elect, chosen people are. So foreknowledge is, the content of foreknowledge is our choice of God. So when you see the word predestined or chosen or elect, don't get all nervous, okay? Johnny Calvin's going to make you nervous when he gets up here. I'm telling you, you don't need to be nervous because we see the word foreknowledge connected with the word predestined, connected with the word chosen, okay? And we know that foreknowledge means there's some content to it. And the content likely is that we chose God. That's the knowledge that he is talking about. We see it again in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, To God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How were they? Chosen? It was according to this that they were chosen. Not independent of his foreknowledge, but according to his foreknowledge. He knew something. And based upon that knowledge, he chose them. Well, it just seems to make sense that 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 would be his knowledge of who chose him. Or else, why would he say foreknowledge? Okay, so foreknowledge, that's one of the biggest ones. Another big one is this concept of prevenient grace. Oops, spelled that wrong. Where's my eraser? Prevenient grace. Have you guys heard of that before? Who here has heard of that? No? Yes? I had to look it up. Okay, good. So, prevenient grace is the concept that even though we are called spiritually dead, we are called basically totally depraved in the New Testament, that we have nothing to offer God spiritually without him intervening in our life. God has supernaturally intervened to give us enough just enough grace to be able to respond to his invitation. So there's a couple of different points that are going to land underneath, underneath this that's going to cause us to say, there must be something that God has done to shift us spiritually into neutral that we can reach out and make some choice. One thing that sticks out is this whole open invitation that we see over and over again in, in Scripture. Jesus walks into town and says, Repent! And believe, for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus says to everyone there, everyone who's listening, he's putting out an offer. Repent and believe. So we would assume that Jesus isn't just saying, repent and believe, if you can. I mean, we don't think he's saying that. I mean, it'd be like a guy rolling into town with a huge pan of brownies and saying, come get a brownie. And you come up and you're like, not for you. Not for you. I will choose who gets the brownie. And it's not you. And he hands it to the person beside you. I mean, that sounds rough, right? So we would say uh, that an open invitation equals the ability to respond. Okay? Why would he say it if he didn't mean it? Is he disingenuous? Why would Jesus say it if he didn't mean it? Another verse that talks about that, and this is on page 34, is in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, it says, the times of ig- In the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. He commands, God commands all men everywhere to repent. So God has commanded that everyone repent. Why would he make a commandment? Why would he call us to do something that we don't have the ability to do? So it seems to make sense. If God calls us to do something, God would give us the ability to do it. Otherwise, why... Am I responsible for a decision that I can't make? How can I be held responsible for a decision that I cannot make? That seems unfair. This speaks to possibly God's character qualities. Another thing, the Bible is very clear that Jesus died for all. He died for all. It says that in 1 Timothy 2.6, 1 John 2.2, 2. Um, it also says in Hebrews 2.9, Jesus died for all. Why would he die for all and then not truly offer it to all? Why would Jesus die for everyone but then not actually offer salvation to everyone? It just, it doesn't make sense to me, okay? So we would say that somehow, somehow, let's, let's break down prevenient grace a little bit more. 
God gives common grace, which is basically this idea or concept that God has displayed his invisible qualities through his visible creation. The Bible says in Romans 1.20 that his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his nature have been clearly seen through what has been made. So there's this common grace given to everyone. Okay? It also talks about the fact that his laws have been written on our hearts in the book of Romans. Okay? That we actually have to, according to Romans 1.19, suppress that truth. Like The truth is so obvious that the only way to get away from it is to suppress that truth in unrighteousness. So we have to hold it down actively for entire lives because it's so obvious. So the common grace that's all around us, whether you believe or you don't believe, is that God's world proclaims, I exist, I exist, I exist. Okay, so there's common grace. There's also saving grace. This is the grace that people experience when they say to Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, and they are completely forgiven in every way. God's grace covers their sin. They receive forgiveness where they didn't deserve forgiveness. They receive blessing where they deserved wrath. So you see common grace and you see saving grace. Provenient grace kind of works right here in the middle. So even in common grace, we're told, sorry, this is so small. (laughs) I can see that. I don't know if anybody else can see that. But that says Romans 119. Even though we're given common grace, what we're told there is that we are suppressing that. Our car is in reverse. That's an R. We've shifted our car into reverse. So even though we have all this common grace, we are not doing what God wants us to do. We're not acknowledging his existence. Romans 1 continues to say that we actually go against God. We suppress this truth and unrighteousness, and it gets worse and worse and worse. We talked about that, I think, in the first class together. So the car, your car is shifted into reverse. In saving grace, okay, God has worked in our life, and we have chosen him, and it is now in, what, first gear? We're now going forward? So we are now in drive. Like, we're cruising forward. What provenient grace does, based upon these realities, is it kind of shifts the car into neutral. Okay, so it shifts the car into neutral. So we now have the ability to actually reach out and make that choice. Okay? Otherwise, why would he have given the invitation? Why would he have died for all? How can he hold me responsible? Okay, so the car, right now, you're The car of someone who doesn't believe is shifted into neutral, and they have the ability to make some decision for Christ. Otherwise, it seems like he's the candy man rolling into town, but not actually giving anyone any candy, but keeps the song on all day long, making everybody crazy. Okay? Next argument. Three. We are not moral robots. What do I mean by that? What I mean is is that if God just called us and said, you have to believe, you have to believe, you have to believe, then it doesn't seem like there's any like, actual response from us. Like We're not looking at him saying, I want to be your child. I'm thankful for being your child. It's more, oh, I'm obligated to be your child. It'd be like you or me being in a country where they determine ahead of time who you're going to marry. So on your 19th birthday, for the first time, I meet some lady. She looks at me, and I look at her, and my parents say, This is your bride. You're getting married in two weeks. Okay, who knows what that's going to look like? She's not real excited about it. I'm not real excited about it. So we are forced into this relationship. That's a very different arrangement than, you know, the way I met my actual wife. We got to know each other. We enjoyed each other. We fell in love. And I said, I want to be with you forever on this earth. And she looks at me and says, I want the same. And then we commit to one another. Get those googly eyes. So, I mean, like, isn't that bring God more glory? Doesn't that bring you more joy? So we are not just moral robots. We are actually glorified in our choosing of God. Like when we choose him and say, I want you more than anything else, that brings glory to him. Uh, He actually says that God desires all to come to know him. Can somebody look up 1 Timothy 2.4? Go ahead and open up your Bible, one of you. And then someone else, could you look up 2 Peter 3, 9. So we see on God's side, he has a longing for us. So one would then think that he would want us to have a longing for him. So 1 Timothy 2, 4. Can someone read that for me out loud? Someone, please. Um, I'll read, but it's KJV. That's okay. 
who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So if I translate that into newer English, it says God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God desires, like there's a longing within God's heart for all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. He wants that. God wants that. 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So here we see that God desires people to come to know him. There's like a longing, a desire. So it would make sense that God would want that same longing and desire in those who do come to him. Okay, it also makes sense that it would be a legitimate invitation if there's a legitimate longing. Okay, so those two things are also connected again. So we see this argument getting stronger. Um, So four... Now, this one's a little bit controversial, even with some of my other buddies who are Arminians. Uh, we can choose God, and we can walk away. Okay? If being with God and being his child is our choice, we also have the choice to then walk away from God if we want. If I chose him, I can then choose not to be with him. It's not like I choose him and then I'm chained in the basement and I never get to leave. Like, God doesn't, like, force me to be with him forever. So, like, lose your salvation? Or, okay. Yeah. So, here's where I'm going to circle this one because there are some in the Armenian camp who would hold exactly to these arguments, but then some would say, some Armenians would say, though old-school Armenian, like, hardcore Armenian would hold to this, but some would say, these are all true, but once you choose God, it's like a handshake, and God doesn't let go on his side. Does that make sense? So you can't lose it. So some would say that. But typically, historically, this is one of the points of Arminianism, as Jacob would say. Okay? So that's your fourth point. Fifth point is Calvinism makes God out to be arbitrary and unfair. I mean, let's just be honest. If God just gets to pick whoever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, he tells everyone that they can come to him, but no one actually can unless he picks them first, it seems arbitrary. It seems unfair. I mean, it's an it's a offer made to all, but it's not actually possible for all to respond. So the picture that kind of lands in my mind is like someone who is at the front of a boat, like a huge boat, and there's just waters, there's a huge lake, and it's just filled with people who are in the water, it's really deep, and they're starting to drown. Okay, their hands are in the air, they're waving. Save me, save me, because he's got more life preservers than he knows what to do with. He has more life preservers than there are people. And they're yelling, save me, and he looks over to a group of five and says, here, you can have one, and tosses to one of the five. Watches the other four drowned. Sees a group of like 12, tosses three out there, and watches the other nine drowned. I mean, that's kind of what we're saying Jesus is like here. Okay? If we're, that's what Calvin's are, the Calvinist is saying is Jesus just arbitrarily picks a few of every group and the rest <coughs> drowned. It feels arbitrary. It feels almost cruel. Okay? So, so, the, so I, Jacob, stay here because this is something I don't want to be associated with. This is hard. This doesn't make sense. It feels brutal, wrong, and unfair. Last argument. Calvinism kills prayer and evangelism. So if God has already picked who will come to know him and who will not come to know him, What is the point of praying for my neighbor? What's the point of sharing the gospel with them? If they are going to come to know Christ, because he's already picked them, if they're part of the chosen, the elect, then no longer has anything to do with me. It's a a God-them situation. Why pray for them? Why go out and share my faith? It's hard. It makes me nervous. It's just easier not to. Okay? So Calvinism, that side over there, kills prayer 
in evangelism. All right, another reason uh, why I, Jacob, like this way of thinking. And how is it that it glorifies God? It glorifies God because I've chosen him and said, you're the most precious being in all the world, all the universe. I want you more than anything else. I think I saw my buddy John Calvin around here somewhere. <laughs> there he is. Hey, I'm John Calvin. <clears throat> so you'll notice, you'll just hang out with my buddy Jacob. Jacob and I are both on the same team. He likes that blue hat. I like this yellow one. But we're both on the same team. We're both, we both root for West Virginia, okay? So even though we land in different places on this, we can still be on the same team. Just want you to notice that before we jump in. So Jacob threw a bunch of stuff at you. Here comes my stuff. Let's go back to this concept, foreknowledge. There's a D in there somewhere, boom. Foreknowledge. So here's something that Jacob didn't mention. There's tons of times where the concept of predestination, chosen, election occurs, and foreknowledge is not mentioned. Foreknowledge is not mentioned. Okay, so there's a chosen, there's a predestined group of people, and foreknowledge is not a part of the equation. So to say that that is the basis for it, you think that it will be mentioned every time that chosen or predestination is mentioned. But it's not. Second thing, this concept or this word foreknowledge is this. It's prognosis. Okay, it looks like prognosis. Prognosis. This is not the concept of just knowing a fact and then responding to a fact. This is more than that. This is, gnosis is this concept of knowing something intimately, having a relationship with it. So this isn't a picture of, of God looking through the timeline, the, you know, the vortex of the timeline and saying, you will choose me, you will choose me, therefore I'll go ahead and ordain it, that you are my predestined chosen people. That's not what it is. Gnosis means that he looks and he knows that person. He looks and he has a relationship with that person. So it's more than just, I see who chooses me. It's more than just a response to a fact. It's, he looks down the timeline and he says, this one I love. This one I know intimately. This one I care about. So it's not just a response situation, it's a relational situation, okay? So that's, that's the concept of foreknowledge. So it's, that's how we have to view it, is viewed as a relationship, not just as a choice. So foreknowledge needs to be seen in the view of a relationship. Okay? And it does not occur. Chosen, elect, predestination stands on its own. It doesn't lean on foreknowledge for information. It doesn't lean on foreknowledge as a necessity to be chosen or be predestined. Oftentimes they are not even a part of that's not even a part of the conversation. So in those verses, when you ask the question, what is the content of the knowledge? The content of the knowledge isn't that they chose God, but that God chose them. Okay? In both cases, in both cases, we have to guess what the foreknowledge is. John, me, the foreknowledge is God making the choice. Jacob, that guy, that last guy with the blue hat, he would say it's based upon them choosing God. But neither, neither way does it say for certain what this word is pointing to. So we have to look at the context around it. The fact that it's relationship and the fact that it's not needed to describe chosen tells me that's based on relationship. Him choosing us. Second one. It's this concept of unconditional election that is irresistible. Unconditional election that is irresistible. This goes back to something we talked about a little bit ago. Spiritually dead equals spiritually dead. Did he show you the verse where prevenient grace is found? No, because it's not in any verses. He showed you some ideas and connected the ideas to the concept, but it's a concept. Like, you can find this in an Armenian systematic theology book, but if you look at my systematic theology book, it's not in there because I only talk about where you see things in Scripture. 
you don't see it directly in Scripture. So over here, this is what I do see in Scripture. We are spiritually dead, which means we are actually spiritually dead. So we read verses like this. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says that the person who does not know God looks at Jesus in the cross and says, this is foolishness. Jesus, you're a fool, and Jesus, what you did was foolish. So the idea that someone who's spiritually dead looks at what he thought, what he thinks is foolish and says, I want a piece of that. I want a part of that. I want to have a relationship with him doesn't really make sense. Also, to compound, to compound the issue, Romans 3, 10 through 12, tells us that no one seeks God. No one. So it says the opposite of this. This says everyone has the ability to seek God. This one says no one has the ability to seek God. This directly says that. No one has the ability to seek God. No one seeks after God. Okay, well, that puts us in a little bit more of a dire situation. So what do we need? We need someone to reach down and save us because we can't reach up and save ourselves. We can't reach to God. We need him to reach down to us, which is why when Jesus was hanging out with a guy named Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. He didn't say, you need to choose me. He said, you need to be born again. And he talked about being born of the water and born of the spirit. Born of the water is this concept of how you were born the first time. The water breaks and the child is born. You have, Jesus is saying here, you have just as much to do with being spiritually born again as what you had to do with you being physically born again. When you were physically born the first time. When you were physically born the first time, you weren't down there saying, go mom, you got this. Oh, I'm stuck. I'll, I'll pull myself out. I'm good. Like, you didn't do that. You didn't play any role in being born the first time. Jesus' point is, you don't have a role when you're born the second time. When you're born spiritually, he's the one that does the work. You don't do the work. That's why he chose the term. That's why he picked that as an illustration, because it fits. That's what's actually happening. He is doing the work. You're not doing the work. Yet, yet, each person is still responsible. Romans 1, 19. Okay. Even though God chooses, and even though everyone is spiritually dead and no one seeks God, the Bible's still clear. Each person is still responsible. But in their depraved state, no one will seek God, yet they are still responsible. That's a hard truth. Okay? So some people just want to try to pretend like it's not there in Scripture. But it's there, and we have to struggle with it and wrestle with it. Okay? There's very clear verses listed after each one of those realities. Okay? So, here's another question. If an invitation is made, does it mean that we automatically have the ability to fulfill it or to respond to it? Does Jesus say thing, things and give us expectations that we can't really attain to? Well, let's look. Matthew 5, 48. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, how'd you do with that today? Me, like you, like everyone else, failed at that. So he called you to do something. It's an expectation that he has of you. But you can't do it. So there are times when Jesus calls you to do something that you can't do. When he walks into town and says, repent and believe, is something that he calls people to and he offers, but it doesn't mean they're able to do it. In fact, let's go to John chapter 10. These verses are written on page 42 in your book. So if you want to, you just go to page 42 with me. In John chapter, chapter 10, there's multiple verses that say kind of the same thing. It's talking about this, this, this idea of Jesus' voice. In John 10, 16, it says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one with the shepherd. So those who he's going to bring in, they're the ones that will hear his voice. He says the same thing in verses 26 and 27. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And that word know there is that intimate knowledge, gnosis know again. My sheep hear my voice, and I intimately know them, and they're the ones who follow me. So as Jesus is making that open invitation, who is the one who actually hears the invitation? Who's the one that can actually respond? It's those who are his sheep. Why did some not respond? Why did some not believe? But you did not believe because you are not my sheep. So who hears and believes the invitation? Those who are his sheep. Who don't? Those who are not his sheep. Sheep respond when they hear their shepherd's voice. Okay, so the invitation is made to all, but it's those who are his sheep, who hear his voice and can actually respond. Okay? Let's go to the next one. God has... God has always chosen. This isn't a new thing. God's always chosen. Think about Adam and Eve. Okay? Did Adam and Eve choose to be made? Did Adam and Eve choose to be the way they were? Did Adam and Eve choose to be in charge of making a decision that would affect, that would affect the entire human race? No, I mean, just God's like, I'm making you this way at this time. You have this responsibility. Boom, there you go. God made them. He chose their situation. He chose the way he made them. He even chose their names. Okay, so he, well, he chose Adam's name and Adam named Eve. It's Adam and Eve. God chose that. When... At the time, his name was Abram, was hanging out. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God chose Abram. There wasn't anything that he did that made him stick out. He was living, he was a, a pagan just like everyone else, worshiping other gods. And then God speaks to him, pulls him to himself and says, I'm going to be your God, and here's a whole bunch of blessings I'm going to give you. He chose Abraham, okay? He chose Isaac. Okay? Um, <clears throat> let's go to Romans 9. And this is a hard verse. So this idea of Esau and Jacob. So in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through, I'll read through 13, it says this. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, and she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it was written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So did God look down through time and say, Jacob makes these good decisions, Esau makes bad decisions, so I love Jacob and I hate Esau? It says the opposite. It says it's not based on works. It doesn't have anything to do with what they're going to do. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with God's choice. For though the twins were not yet born and had, done, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand... Okay? He made the choice. He loved one and not the other. It was based on his choice, not based on their choice, not based on their actions. It was a choice that he made. So when it comes to Jacob and Esau, God chose. He just did. So Jacob and Esau. Okay? Those are hard verses, and we'll come, we'll come back to those. Uh, Deuteronomy 14. Here's one more. See how fast we can get there. So Deuteronomy 14, he's talking about the people of God. He's talking about the Israelites. In Deuteronomy 14, 2, he says this, You are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, so out of all the peoples, God chose this people. He just chose them. He chose this people. Now, if you know the nation of Israel and you know the history of the nation of Israel, do you choose them because they're such a great people who always follow him all the time? I mean, they never follow him. 
I mean, there'd be a season or a generation where they turned to him, but then the next generation was consistent. They would turn to idols and they would fall away. So it certainly wasn't based upon how much they loved him. He simply just chose to love them, is what we see happen. So God, again, is a God who chooses. Okay? When we see in the book of Ephesians, so this is back in the Old Testament, but even today, in Ephesians 1, I think it's 3 through 5, and in, we'll look this one up, 2 Timothy 2.10. The word foreknowledge isn't even mentioned, but it just says that God chose us before the world even began. So God chose, 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 and even today he still chooses. Let's go to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy 2.10. Here's Paul. Paul is talking about his, his passion and energy for, mi for mission. If I can get there. Okay, 2.10. It says this. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with an eternal glory. Why does he endure all things? Why does he go through suffering and hardship? I mean, he's in prison here. Why does he go through stuff like that? is for the sake of those who are chosen. Like, he views a group of people who are chosen, and he'll go through really hard things for the sake of those people. Okay? So Paul doesn't look and say, wow, because God chose them, I shouldn't work hard or pray or take care of them or minister to them. He says, because they're the chosen, because they're the apple of God's eye, because God has placed their love on them, they have value. Therefore, I'll do whatever it takes to take care of them. He loves them. This point here was that we can choose God, and therefore we have the ability to walk away from God. From my point of view, that's not what Scripture says, me being John Calvin. I would say God chooses, and then God preserves. Okay, God chooses, and God's the one who preserves. So when we see Philippians 1.6, where it says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We see God started the work, and God will finish the work. Okay, so it's not based upon you. You're kept because it's based upon him. All right, so verses that just flat out say God chooses. Uh, we can look at a bunch, but let's just look at a few. So we'll go to page 43 in your book. There's a bunch there on that page. Back to John. Now we're in John chapter 6. This is Jesus speaking. Okay, this is Jesus speaking. So again, remember the question. Do we choose God or does God choose us? John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me. So the Father's one who's giving to Jesus those who believe. John 6, 44, just a little bit later. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So, yes, there's an open invitation, but as a Calvinist, I would say there isn't necessarily ability. Unless the Father draws him, there isn't ability, according to verse 44. John 6:65. 6, no one can come to me unless it's been granted him from the Father. When Jesus repeat things, repeats things like he is here, usually it's because he considers it important for us to know. John 15, 16. I mean, listen to this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Okay? I feel like I could do a Calvinist mic drop right there. Okay? You did not choose me. So this whole argument is I chose him. Jesus looked at the people and said, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. So Jesus looks him dead in the eye and says, you can't pat yourself on the back. You can't boast. It wasn't a choice that you made. You didn't make a better choice than the person beside you. I chose you. Because part of this whole conversation of salvation, and we see this in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We see this in... 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 27, 28, 29. I didn't write those down, but in both of those, 
the result of salvation is that no man can boast. No man can boast. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about the fact that God didn't pick the wise of the world and the wealthy of the world and the strong of the world. He picked people like you and me, the weak, the needy, the desperate. Okay, so when we come into heaven, none of us get to pat ourselves on the back because God chose the weak, the needy, and those who needed him. That's us, 1 Corinthians. In Ephesians, it talks about the fact that that is by grace we are saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, so that no man can boast. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift. Why? Because Jesus did it, so that no man can boast. If you and I had any percentage of, of, um, of the choice, like if, if God chose me 98% and I chose him 2%, even that 2% gives me just a little bit of room to say, I did better than the guy beside me who didn't choose him. Even if it's the smallest percentage, on some level, I can pat myself on the back as I walk through the gates of heaven. I know Jesus did the work on the cross for me, but I still am the one who made a better choice than the people who didn't make the same choice. Okay? Only when God does all of the picking and choosing does God get all of the glory, and I can't put my hand on my back and just say, I'm not worthy, but your love overwhelms me. I will praise you and glorify you forever as your child. Okay? So that's, that's, the, that's the idea, that's the concept there with those verses. Where are we at? God preserves us. So let's look at one more verse here. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In verses 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38 and 39. This is, these verses are written to everyone who's a believer. Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. So when he says nor things to come, that means any choices that you might make in the future, including a choice to try to walk away from God, okay, that includes that, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these things can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our identity, Ephesians, is that we are in Christ Jesus. That's saying you cannot, you cannot get into a position where you're no longer a Christian you can no longer have your identity fall outside of Christ because none of those things can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, who is your identity. It also says, no created thing. You, my friend, are a created thing. You cannot create a situation where you can separate yourself from the love of God. You don't have the power to pry God's hand and his love off of your life and break free and walk away from God's love. So nothing in the future, no decision you can make in the future, and you don't have the strength in your own hands to remove the hand of God on your life as a Christian. So God chooses, and his love preserves you. You don't walk away. He's got you. Okay? So you can have assurance of salvation, not because of you, but because of him. He chose you, and he holds you. Fifth argument. Potter and clay. We're going to go back to Romans 9. We're going to do 14 through 21. Okay. So before we jump into that, this gives us a very different picture. So, so I know Jacob pretty well. I've, I saw him earlier, and he told me he was going to be using this, um, the boat illustration. He used that boat illustration where it makes Jesus look really terrible. So let, let's go back to that illustration. So the illustration was Jesus standing on this huge boat with all these life preservers, and everyone is waving, asking for help, and he throws a life preserver to few, a few of them, and others slash everyone else drowns. Is that really the situation? Biblically, it's not a bunch of people waving to Jesus asking for his help. Biblically, the lake is full of people, and 100% of them are basically giving Jesus the double-barrel middle finger saying, that. Like, I want nothing to do with you. I'd rather serve the devil than serve you. I'm not about your glory. In fact, I hate your glory. I won't have anything to do with your glory. I'm going to live my life in such a way that I take glory away from you. I'm going to steal your glory. I'm going to do things my own way. I want to have nothing to do with you. I hate you. The lake is full of people who are saying that. They're not saying, come help me. I see that you could save me. Would you please save me? They're saying those other things. 
That's what this whole concept of depravity is. We've read all that for a whole hour, how depraved we are. The lake is full of people like that. You were in that lake, doing that. I was in that lake, doing that, living life my own way. The fact that he throws anyone a life preserver is beyond comprehension. It's more grace than we can fathom. He, I don't know why he saved any of us. None of us deserved it. We were fighting against his grace. We were saying, no, I don't want your grace. I don't have anything to do with you. And even in our hatred of him, even in our pushing it away, not wanting it, he still saves us anyways. That's the kind of God he is. So that's a different way of looking at it, okay? Same illustration, but let's not pretend like the people are waving, saying, help me, help me, Jesus. They're doing other things with their hands. They hate Jesus. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They say, you're a fool, and what you did on that cross was foolish. That's what the Bible says, okay? So it's a different picture than maybe what Jacob painted. I think the, the picture looks much more grim than that. So when we go to Romans 9, I wonder if the page. So Romans 9. <clears throat> so we just read that in verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. That should have rubbed you a little wrong. That's hard. Like, why? He just said it's not based upon what they did. So what did it come from? How did God choose to love one and not the other? Paul knows that's hard. And this is his response to that. He says, verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God is the God of the universe. And he's already declared, he's already said, I, God, will have pa compassion on who I choose to have compassion. I will have mercy on who I have mercy. So it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he, has, whom he desires. You will, say to the, you, will, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? On the contrary, this is God's response. So when we're sitting back saying, if you're giving me an invitation, how can you hold me responsible? Why am I responsible? Paul says, on the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me this way? Or does, the, does not the potter have a right over the clay to make the same lump, one vessel, one vessel for honorable use and the other for common use? So, when we're standing in the presence of God, we have to remember who the potter is and who the clay is. Every morning you wake up and look in the mirror, you are staring at clay. You are staring at clay. The potter does whatever he wants with the clay. He can make it and form it to be whatever he wants it to be. He can have whatever use for it that he wants to have for it. He gets to be the potter. You and I are simply clay. So, so notice this. If we could just choose God, Paul wouldn't have said any of these things. What Paul would have said is, well, it's because Jacob chose God and Esau didn't. But that's not what he said. He said, God chooses whoever he wants. So obviously, God chooses whoever he wants. And this can't be true. This can't be true, because if this is true, why did Paul make this argument? The only reason why these verses exist is to clarify and let you know that you're not going to get this. This isn't true. This is what's true, and it's just flat out hard. But God understands the hows and the whys behind it. And since he's the creator and the potter, he gets to make those decisions. And you and I, with great humility and respect, trust that he knows what's best, driving us to what glorifies him the most. He's the potter. We are the clay. One more. Oh, time's going fast. <laughs> Well, we have two more. Uh, let's look at this one first. Nature of grace. Go ahead and turn in your books to page 40. I want you to read this quote with me. Page 40. It's by a guy named R.C. Sproul. And he's talking about grace. And he wants us to make sure that we understand the nature of grace. So there in the top part, it says, the Arminian still battles. So we're going to read that in the next little quote. It says, 
The Arminian still battles against this point with the same line of argument. God will treat all men alike in giving all a chance to respond to his general call to repentance and faith. We saw that. Like, that's, that's this. He needs to give everyone an equal opportunity. The objection raised by the philosopher implies that God owes his love to sinful creatures. That is, the unspoken assumption is that God is obligated to be graceful and gracious to sinners. What the philosopher overlooks is that if grace is obligated, it is no longer grace. The very essence of grace is that it is undeserved. To say, God, if you don't do it this way, you're not full of grace. That, by nature, is the opposite of what grace is. Grace is fully and completely undeserved. So those who were chosen received it when they didn't deserve it, okay? God wasn't obligated to shift the car into neutral. To say he's obligated to, to be fair, kills the whole concept of what grace even is. Here's the last one. Seven. With this line of thought, we now can have confidence in prayer and evangelism. Well, John, how does that work out? Because Jacob said it kills prayer and evangelism. Well, let's look at it this way. If man chooses God, if man chooses God, then depending on the way you share the gospel with someone might determine whether they say yes to God or no to God. Say you're going out to share the gospel and you have got a, a green track in this pocket and you've got a yellow track in this pocket. Okay? You come up to someone and they clearly want to hear what you believe. So the yellow one, you don't know this, but that guy, his puppy was ran over last week by a yellow school bus. He hates the color yellow. When you pull that yellow track out, he's already mad. The green track, his mom dresses it with a green dress. Every Christmas, his favorite presents are associated with the color green. So whether you pull out the yellow or the green might determine whether or not he wants to listen to you. What's going to happen? Okay? So point being is if man makes the choice, then you as the person sharing the gospel, the way you share it and the clarity with which you share it might determine whether or not that person goes to heaven or hell. So for me, John Calvin, I'm paralyzed with fear. I don't want to share the gospel. What if I do it wrong? What if the next person was going to share it right and that person would have chosen God, but because I shared it and I wasn't clear, or I said it in a weird way, or I used a colored track that he hates, he said no, and now he's going to be in hell forever because I did it wrong. With this system, I trust God's in control. That when I share the gospel, if God has called that person as Jesus the shepherd calling one of his sheep, their eyes lighten up. God calls them, they're born again, they see Jesus as beautiful instead of foolish, and they receive Jesus. So it's not based upon how I perform, it's based upon God's sovereignty and him choosing and picking them. Okay, so now I have the freedom to pray with confidence and share with confidence because I trust God's sovereign control. Why do I jump into it? Because he tells me, blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. I want blessing. I want to experience joy in God. So to be a part of what God's doing is blessing in my life. And if I feel blessing and joy and excitement in my life, I bring more glory to God. So me being involved with those things does what I feel like I was created to do. Bring more glory to God. So those are my seven main arguments. I felt like that guy was picking on me when I wasn't here. Let me just throw up a couple other thoughts here to make sure that you know there's some other ways of thinking about this. Okay, Romans 9. That sounded pretty convincing. Now, the way that we need to understand this is when he's talking about Jacob and Esau, he's not talking about individuals. Each of them represented a nation, okay? So the concept here is nations, not individuals. Not individuals. If, when it comes to this whole prayer comment, Colossians 4, 1 through 4, if it doesn't matter how I share the gospel, then why does Paul pray in Colossians 4, 1 through 4 that the Colossians would be praying that he can speak with clarity? He prays, help me share the gospel with clarity. So for some reason, Paul believes it matters how he shares the gospel because he wants them to pray for clarity, okay? If clarity didn't matter, if God was going to choose him regardless, why would he pray for that? Okay, so that's the other point of thinking through that.
What do you think? What arguments stuck out to you? I was ready to give up on even listening to you halfway through. Through which one? All of it. I mean, you don't, I'm thinking, why do I need to know this? I mean, this Ooh. is confusing me. Okay, that's actually a really good response, but keep and, going. But as you got closer and closer to your conclusion, more things became a little clearer to me, so I'm glad I didn't give up on you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a series of arguments that have been taking place since the 300s in the church. We did it, but we're not going to keep going with it. Like, I'm glad that we did it, but we're not going to live here. This was a one-time conversation, not a forever conversation. The thing that confused me the most, I mean, I understood those sad, well, overstatements, the walk away part. I had mm. no idea that was over there. So typically, and that's why I circled it, typically this is consistent with this thought pattern. Like, you can go back through Arminian um, theologians, and they're going to usually hit here. Okay? So... In Calvinism, there's this, there's this thing called tulip, that we're totally depraved, that there's unconditional election, that there's irresistible grace, that Jesus had a limited atonement. He died just for those who were saved, and P, the preservation of the saints. So they would say, Calvinists would say, that God preserves his own. Over here, they would say, God does not preserve his own. You chose him, you can walk away from him, typically. Some, though, kind of live like some... Well, let's use the right color. Some do this. Some go uh, straight down this line, then they go boom to the preserves, and then comes back over, and then starts back here. Like, literally, they do that. Like, that's, that's what some of them do. That's you. Okay. So some do that. What's that? When, like, you hear the expression, losing your salvation, some believe you can, some believe you can't. Over here. It's on that side. It's on this side. It's on that side. So there's an inconsistency here. Okay. Yeah, my whole premise when I talk to uh, people that are asking me about my faith, and especially if they ask you about Muslim faith or any other faith, mm -hmm. the beauty of Christianity is the fact that we, as Christians, God gave us a choice. That's the whole premise of Christianity. Is the fact that Jesus... According to, this is, that's according to Jacob, that sounds Jesus really good. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He just flipped in his grave, by the way, but keep going. <laughs> died on our died on the cross for our sins, rose the, rose the third day. That is the basis of, quote, Christianity as Christians. That's now, from, no, no, but your basis, wait, 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 wait. But your basis was, you just gave that an Armenian basis. I'm just going to tell you, if you're on John's bus, he just kicks you off the bus. Because he would say, salvation is based upon the glory of God and on God himself, not on us, and that he's, he died on the cross so that he could choose us to glorify himself. So that's just a different way of saying what you said. So you set it up with this being the foundation for what you're going to say next, which is great, because I'm not even telling you what I am. But just realize you said, I'm this, and then you're about to say something. But you said, this is the foundation, but you just got kicked off his bus. You see, and then you have the Catholicism, where they believe that you can walk away and mm -hmm. be condemned. You, that's your choice. You, know, you can walk away. You can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. you know, if you commit mortal sin, venial sin, cardinal sins, you build them up, the mortal sin, boom, you're gone. You're gone. Yeah. Now, as far as Calvin is concerned, if you're, lucky to be chosen. If you're chosen, you could do anything you want when you're not gone. See, that's, how do you, and then how do you know you're chosen? So, if I put my the yellow, of the fact oh. that you have a choice, you have personally made a, a personal choice. Okay. And consequently, you feel good about the fact that you're going to be saved. Okay, so that's this side. If I put my yellow hat back on, I go to this side to respond to what you just said there. This person would say, well, outwardly it looks the same. Here you're saying you chose God and were saved. We're saying God chose you, you were born again, and after he regenerated you, then you look to Jesus and you're like, I want you, and you fall in love. So it looks exactly the same outwardly here as it does here. They would say there's no difference. Okay, when God chose you, he changed your heart so much that you now are falling deeply in love with him here, just as much here. That's what John would argue. Jacob would say what you said, but John would argue the other side. Okay, let's go, let's go just a little bit further with this, okay, and then we'll, we'll close. So, if we... There's a camera right there, so I need to get this on camera. That's why I have two. So, say we... Sorry if I block you for a second. Say we go out on the beach, 
and we see these dots on the beach. And we look over to them, and you know how you can write in the sand? And over here it says human responsibility. This one says God's justice. This one in sand, it says his, his grace. This one says his sovereignty. This one says his love. <coughs> so the Bible talks about all these different things. Okay, so we're, we're looking at those things. We're saying to ourselves, how do these things attach? We're trying to figure out how they attach. Are, are they like a circle? Are the, is there a dotted line from one to the other? Like, how do these things go together? Okay, so from our point of view, we're trying to figure out how the dots connect. Human responsibility, God's sovereignty, his justice, his grace, how do they connect? From God's perspective, he knows he took his hand, and he simply put his hand into the sand and pulled it away, and those are his fingerprints. You and I can see his fingerprints. From God's point of view, he sees how they all come together. He sees exactly how they all line up together and fit together in who he is and his character and his attributes. There's no complexity to him with those things. But to you and me, our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. So no matter how sure we feel like we are, on this side, whether you're John or Jacob, or someone in between, sorry, wrestling match with that table, there is a reality that there is still, like it or not, mystery. There's mystery. The Bible seems to speak with this concept of there being human responsibility. But even with Adam and Eve, like they chose to eat the fruit. Even from the beginning, there was something that were, man was making a choice. But yet you still see in Scripture this concept that God made the choice. Like you kind of see both. Okay? So this idea that you have to, that one camp is absolutely right and one camp is absolutely wrong, or this camp is absolutely right and that camp is absolutely wrong, just be slow. There's something mysterious about this that's a little beyond us. We're trying to trace out fingerprints, but we can't see the way they connect, like how God can see how they connect. Okay, so allow there to still be room for mystery. Never poke fun at somebody who lands on the other side than you. Okay, this is not the most important thing. Okay, the fact that Jesus died and you have chosen him, whether he plucked you out or you, he, he, you, pl you chose him, the result is the same. Okay, let's take joy in that. So allow room for mystery, okay? That's where I'm going to land here with this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to close. You can hang and talk with me more if you want, okay? Father, thank you so much for the reality of whether we chose you or you chose us. The result is that Christ is now ours forever, and we get to be the bride of Christ now and forever with our brothers and sisters and know you and be with you forever. So we love you. We thank you. Continue to make your word clear allow us to be changed by it. In Christ's name, amen.